Greetings radio people, welcome back to my shack. I wanted to share with you a bit of a journey that I've been on recently. I bought myself some ADF4351 modules off Amazon and I've been doing a bit of arsing about with them and I've ended up building quite a neat signal generator for the shack. So this is the device that I've ended up making. I'm really quite pleased with this, it's quite neat. It's got a full touchscreen control. So you can enter a frequency in megahertz anywhere between 35 and 4.4 gigahertz and then the output adjusts appropriately. So the touchscreen control is really quite neat and simple. So I've done quite a lot of experimentation with this so I thought I'd share with you the journey that I've been on and explain how I've built this bit of kit which is really quite useful. So let's get on with it. So before we go any further, I'll just show you the two modules that I've been fiddling with. There's this one here, which I'll, I'll link both of these down below. They're both available on Amazon. This one's available on Prime with a next day delivery. Uh, it's basically a copy of the analog devices evaluation board. There's a 25 megahertz oscillator on the board for this particular example and a voltage regulator. I think the voltage regulator is probably quite poor quality as is probably the crystal oscillator but for uh, experimentation it's very good and at the price point of 2169 uh, I just can't beat it. You can't even buy the individual chip for that I don't think. The other one that I've got is this one. This is by SV1 AFN. He makes some excellent uh, modules and components. Um, I've got one of these here. There's no onboard power supply. There's no onboard oscillator. You have to use an external reference. But this is a much better built circuit board, probably better components. Um, so this is probably the one that I would choose if I was if I was going to be making one of these today. But as I said, I'll link both of them down below so you can go and have a look and you can see what I'm using. So rather than just stealing other people's software, I really wanted to understand how this device worked and what you actually need to do to make it function. Now the Analog Devices website contains a whole wealth of information on this ADF4351, but the data sheet for the device is an excellent place to start. The data sheet explains how the device works, gives you a pretty good overview, and it explains that there are six 32-bit registers that you need to program to configure the device how you want it to operate. The datasheet also details uh, the maths that you need to use to get from a target frequency, um, a clock frequency and channel spacing to the actual output that you require and how to go from those numbers to the values needed for the registers. Now page 11 of the datasheet which is in front of us at the moment, this contains the equations. There's equation number one here and there's equation number two up here. And then page 14 of the data sheet, which starts here, has got the overview of the different registers and what all of the different bits do. So the first thing I did was create myself this spreadsheet uh, by means of a sort of learning exercise so that I really understood the maths. There's three user inputs up here. So there's the target frequency you're looking for. So let's say we're looking for an output of 500 megahertz, the channel spacing value, and then the frequency reference. So in my case, I'm gonna use my shack frequency reference, which is 10 megahertz. If you're gonna use the Amazon board with the onboard clock, you'd need to change that to be 25. But once you've entered those three numbers down there, you hit the calc button. That then calculates these values here, which you'll see on the equations on the uh, data sheet. It then also calculates the hex values for the registers, for the six 32-bit registers that we need to use to program this device. There's two other things that it does as well. Once it calculates the frac and the modulus, it then goes ahead and calculates the greatest common denominator for those two so that we can simplify the fraction to get the, the most integer simple version of that. The other thing this spreadsheet does down here, it reapplies the algorithms from the spreadsheet sorry, from the data sheet to these numbers here to calculate the output frequency independently. And as long as those two are the same, this goes green. If for any reason that's gone red, it means my maths is a load of dingoes, kidneys. So let me just quickly show you the macros down here, which I've brilliantly called do stuff. You see, I always very carefully name my procedures. Now, if we look in the, the code that's underneath this Excel spreadsheet, there's a number of functions. One here that selects the divisor, 
based on the into uh, based on the target frequency similarly for the register 4 that hex value I only alter that based on the target frequency then I calculate the values that you see on the spread on the data sheet so there's calculation of n int mod and frac and then this is the function that calculates the greatest common denominator and then the do stuff subroutine that you've got here most of this is just filling in the numbers on the spreadsheet and making it look pretty but it also calls the functions that we've seen up above and then does the final decimal to hex conversion at the bottom here to create the hex values that we've seen in the uh, registers on the spreadsheet as I said I'll, I'll link this in you're welcome to download it and have a play with it and hopefully it'll be of use to someone So the next thing I wanted to do was actually test the theory out. So what I've done here is very quickly create some Arduino software um, that will write these hex values that my spreadsheet is generating. We'll just throw these down an SPI serial link to the ADF4351 boards that I've got. Now the code on the left, there's nothing original about this. There's plenty of examples of this around on the internet. But what I've done is if you see the six hex values that are generated here, those six values there I've copied up to this variable up here, this array up here of uh, unsigned 32-bit integers. So there's six unsigned 32-bit integers with these six values in here. And then this software here is gonna throw these at the ADF4351. So rather than explaining to you how this software works, I think it's much better to show you. But the SPI function, spi.transfer, is a library function. So all the clever stuff is going on inside this library. There's nothing clever in this code at all. It's simply telling it what numbers to send. So what I've done here is the, I've got an Arduino Dewey, I think it's called, D-U-E is the board, which is a 3.3 volt logic level. It's very important to make sure you understand that the ADF4351 logic levels are 3.3 volts. So if you're using a Nano or a, a Uno or any of the five volt logic leveled Arduino boards, you need to put some potential dividers. And I've put some information on that in the header of the Arduino code, which I'll link in to the video below. But what I've done here, I've put my logic analyzer uh, between the Duo board and the ADF4351 to effectively sniff the data as it transfers. Now the software is designed to send the data once every two seconds. It doesn't need to do that, but I've done that to facilitate capturing it with the logic analyzer. So what we've got here, this is the uh, clock this is the data line and this is the chip select line and then I've set up a, um, a decode line to decode the SPI data. So if we look you can see that the, the last register value that we've got down here, register 5, is 580005 and you can see that up here we've got 00580005. So this is decoding the values that we've been sending to the ADF4351. And the way that this SPI works basically is that the, um, the clock goes high for every bit that you want to send to the device. So in this case, we've got one register is 32 bits. So that's four chunks of eight bits. When the clock goes high, the device reads the data line. So in this case, there's eight highs, so eight bits of data. Every one of those bits of data is zero. But in this case, you can see that the clock is for the for the eight the eight bits of the clock where it goes high, the data in this case is zero one zero one. When in that case zero one zero one in binary is five in decimal. So that's where that five comes from. And then the next four bits are one zero zero zero, which is the eight. So you see that that's how the data transfer works. And that SPI transfer library that we saw in the Arduino code is doing all this clever stuff for us. The only thing that my code is doing is clocking this high and low at the end of every 32-bit register transfer. So from this, you can see quite clearly that there are five or rather six bursts of data being sent to the device. We can see what those values are here. So C80000 is my C80000. So you can see that this is working perfectly and it's sending the data as we expect to the ADF at 4351. 
So it's not the easiest thing to illustrate, but um, this is this working on the bench. So this is the Arduino DUE, DUE, or I'm not sure how to say it properly, um, which is a 3.3 volt logic board. I'll put a link to that underneath the video. This is the ADF4351 board that I showed you earlier. I'll also put a link to that. This cable here is coming in from my shack frequency reference, which is terminated in 50 ohms, right, just off the shot. So that's the 10 megahertz reference frequency. Then this is the output of the ADF4351, which is going through an attenuator here into my spectrum analyzer. And from the register values that we've just seen captured by the logic analyzer, you can see that we've got a marker at one gigahertz, which is the carrier that's being generated by this, by this board right now. And this box here is my logic analyzer, which I've simply got connected up to the SPI lines that are transferring between here and here. The wiring for the Nano and the Uno I'll, is in the header of the code. I'll also link in a quick diagram to show how to wire the Dewey board to the ADF4351. So very much as a and finally, the actual device that I built that sat on the bench that I showed you at the very beginning with the touch screen and the nice uh, screen interface is built using something called a Micromite. Um, this, I don't know whether any of you have looked at everyday practical electronics in the UK or practical electronics as it's now called, or I believe there's something called the Silicon Chip Magazine in Australia. That uh, has had a number of projects in there that have used this Micromite. It's a 32-bit programmable interface controller with uh, a basic interpreter um, and there's something called the LCD Backpack. Now that's down here, uh, Micromite 2.8-inch LCD Backpack Kit. So this is the Micromite board plus the screen that you can see. Now, I only bought the PCB for £5 GBP. The screen was about 8 99 from AliExpress and I programmed the chip myself because I have pick programmers and all that kind of gubbins here. So there's quite a few ways to do this, but have a look at micromite.org um, and that's what the, uh, the software, the final software is running in. You can download an editor called MM Edit, which interfaces to your Micromite via USB very much like the Arduino board's interface. Uh, you can download your code from the editor down onto the board, run it, see the results, edit it. It's an interpreted language basic, so it'll never be as fast as something that's compiled, but the processor is very quick and it seems to work very, very well. Now this software here, 90% of which I've stolen, um, all of the stuff that does the graphics, no originality for that whatsoever. But what I have done is written the maths and transferred that from the spreadsheet and the VBA that we had that we saw earlier. That's now written in here inside this subroutine here that does the register calculations. Um, and this is what's running and has produced the final product, if you like, that I've got running on the bench. So thanks for your interest. If it's been of use to you, please subscribe to the channel. Uh, that's very important to me. And uh, if you like what I do, a thumbs up would be appreciated. Uh, if you've got any questions, feel free to use the comments below or you can always get in touch with me using qrz.com.